Hello everyone, how are you? Welcome to our webinar. I hope you are all doing well and that you can all hear me. Please let me know in the chat if you can all hear me. How are you doing today? Brilliant, Malik, I'm glad you can hear me. I hope you are well. So before we get started, bienvenue, bonjour, uh, bienvenue à ce webinaire ouvert à tous. Uh, avant de commencer, pour ceux qui ne nous connaissent pas, uh, je m'appelle Cécilia, je suis un, une professeure d'anglais natif et le Cercle des langues, c'est une école d'anglais en ligne pour les adultes. Uh, nous proposons des formations d'anglais sur mesure en fonction de vos, vos objectifs, de votre niveau et de votre budget. Et la bonne nouvelle, c'est que nos formations sont finançables par CPF. So, uh, please do let me know how you are doing in the chat. It's lovely to see you all. I will now, of course, be speaking English so that we can start the lesson, start the webinar. I'm glad you're all well and it is very lovely to see you. So today we are going to be covering an important business English topic. We're going to be looking at how to make a persuasive pitch. Now, there are many different types of pitch. Perhaps you have had to do a sales pitch or pitch an idea to an investor, or maybe you've even given an elevator pitch about yourself. Now, an elevator pitch, if you aren't familiar with this term, I'll write it down, is a very, very short uh, pitch, which uh, supposedly could take the amount of time you would spend in an elevator, in a lift. But uh, the thing that all these different types of pitch have in common is that you are trying to convince someone Uh, of something that you are suggesting. So it might be a product, if it's a sales pitch, you might be convincing an investor of your idea or of your company. But what you need to do is be able to be persuasive and convince them that what you are saying is uh, important, is valuable. So to help you do this, we're going to be dividing our webinar into three parts today. So part one is going to be showing your expertise. Uh, part two is going to be suggesting solutions. And part three is going to be answering technical questions. So let's get started. So when it comes to a pitch, of course, uh, you want to show that you know what you're talking about because then you can convince the person that you're pitching to that they can trust you, that they can trust what you're saying and that they can trust your idea as well. And often when you are pitching, you need to present a problem. So then what you're pitching is going to offer the solution to that problem. But of course, if you want to show your expertise, you need to show that you have a clear understanding of the problem. Some people also call uh, a problem a pain point. I'll write that in the chat as well. This is a problem that needs solving that you have noticed, a pain point. So. First of all, we're going to have a look at how you can introduce a problem, show where a problem is that needs solving. Now, of course, you want to make the problem you are trying to solve seem widespread or relatable. So if you're pitching a, uh, something for a sale, you want the person you're speaking to to identify with the problem and to think, I have that problem too. Maybe I need the product that you are trying to sell me or the service. Likewise, if you're trying to convince an investor 
that your business is worth a lot, you will want to prove to them that there are a lot of people who are going to want to buy your product or use your service. So some phrases we can in use to introduce a problem as widespread. We can talk about the typical. So you might like to say, the typical business spends lots and lots of time on recruitment. So this is saying most businesses, the typical business, if you took your average business. And uh, I used the phrase already, most. This again makes a generalization. You're saying more than half. So more than half of businesses uh, spend more time than they need to uh, in meetings, for instance. That's another way of presenting a potential problem. Similarly, people around the world, people around the country. This is a way of talking about a big group of people. Again, making your problem seem uh, fairly general and applicable to many people. Now, you could use the phrase, we see, for a problem you've identified out of your experience out of the fact that you are obviously an expert in your field. So hopefully you should have a clear understanding of what is happening. So to relate these observations back to you, you can say, we see, we see businesses constantly struggling to find the right people to hire, for instance. Now, if you would like to present the problem as being relatable for the person you are pitching to, you can ask them a question, perhaps about if they have experienced a problem. So one uh, phrase you could use to do this is the phrase, do you ever? So when you're using you, of course, you are directly addressing the people you are pitching to and you're appealing to their own emotions, their own feelings, and it can be a powerful way to convince them of your idea. So you might like to say, uh, do you ever find it difficult speaking English when you're on holiday, for instance? That's suggesting a problem and suggesting that the person you are speaking to might identify with that problem. And again, have you ever, this is the same question, but put into the past tense, so suggesting, has this been a problem for you before? Have you ever been unable to talk to someone because you don't speak English? This is something that's happened in the past, a past experience which still presents a problem and you are going to uh, identify that with your listener. So now that we can think about where the problem might be, we can think about what the problem might be. So these are some phrases that you could use to define a problem once you've identified it. So uh, one particular problem is if there is too much of something, if something, for instance, takes too much time, this means that it's taking more than it should, more than you want it to. That's what too much means. And then not enough is the opposite of too much. It means you aren't able to get the level that you would like. You're not able to, you're not able to achieve what you would like. Now, too many. This, uh, of course, is using the same two as we used with too much. It's overdoing it. When we have two, that just means there's more than we want. So if we have too many choices, for instance, that can be a problem because now you don't know which one to choose and you might not end up choosing anything. If something is too hard, then it is too difficult. So you might like to present uh, a problem as being that many managers find it too hard to manage their teams remotely, for instance. Maybe a problem people are experiencing now when everyone is working from home. If you want to describe something as unwelcome, 
This is the opposite of welcome with this prefix un at the beginning. It means it's not welcome. It's not something you want. So if you're having unwelcome side effects, these are side effects that you don't like at all. Next, we have costly. Now, if something is costly, it means it costs a lot of money. It is very expensive. So you could identify perhaps lots of people are using costly, uh, costly messaging platforms, for instance. That's a problem if they want to use a less expensive way of communicating. Of course, Jean-Jacques, I will slow down. I apologize. So next we have the phrase labor intensive. So the phrase labor intensive means that something takes a lot of work. It takes more work than you would like it to take. It takes a lot of effort or a lot of work. And finally, we have the phrase a growing need. If there is a growing need, this means there is an increase in the need for something. There is, for instance, we could say now, uh, because everyone is working from home, there is a growing need for high-tech uh, video conference platforms, for instance. So that is identifying a problem. Now, another way to show that you know what you are talking about is to use hard evidence or data. And we're going to look at some ways you can introduce data or facts depending on where you got those facts from. So first, you could say according to a study. Now, a study is a piece of research done so maybe you read a study on how many people take uh, public transport to work. Then you could say, according to a study, 20% of people take the tube to work. The tube is the equivalent to the metro, the underground um, in London. Uh, next, you could say independent results show. So now these are results of research. And when you say something is independent, it means it's not related to you. It's taken place uh, apart from you. And you might like to emphasize this because it shows that the results are not biased. This word biased means that they have been uh, uh, kept in a way or uh, found in a way that is to prove something particular. So I might say uh, that uh, London is the best city because I am biased, I'm from there, so I can't make an objective uh, comment on that. So if you say that a study is independent, it means it's not based on perhaps your pre-existing ideas. Again, we could say research shows. Now, uh, research is a study. It means that people have gone out and tried to gather some information. So if research shows something, it means that these are the results of research. These are the facts we have found. And finally, you can use the phrase, our customers say. Now, this is if you have received customer feedback. So this is comments from your customers. People have bought your products or maybe used your services. Maybe they have left reviews. Maybe they have contacted you. So if you can give customer feedback, real comments from real customers, of course, this can be very convincing. So now we are going to have a quick look at what we've learned so far. Can anyone type in the chat, what is uh, a phrase that means something takes too much 
or a lot of effort or work. Uh, Ariane, yes, you could say according to the literature. Uh, that's probably more of a scientific uh, or academic term. Uh, you would say according to the literature, but you could definitely refer to literature. In this case, literature refers to anything written about a particular subject. So that could be articles, that could be studies, that could be books. I hope that answers your question, Ariane. It's quite academic to say according to the literature. Uh, yes, labor intensive. That is the correct answer, very nice. So the next question, can you fill in the gap? Yes, very nice, everyone. It is results. Um, Arnaud, just to say for this sentence, if it was a study, we would have to have um, the verb be a study shows. So this show is for a plural noun, whereas if we wanted to say an independent study shows, we would need that uh, S at the end of the verb. So that's how we know that this has to be a, uh, a, a plural subject. Uh, great, everyone. So now we're going to move on to suggesting your solution. So once you have identified a problem in your pitch, you can start to talk about what your solution is what you suggest as an alternative. Now, in terms of presenting your solution, here are some words you can use to uh, talk about what your solution does in terms of solving the problem. So first we have the word automate. Now, if you are automating a process, it means you are converting it so that it can be done by a machine. Obviously, this might make things quicker uh, for maybe an industry which previously had things done by hand, done by people. If you automate it, it could be quicker. We have the word streamline. To streamline is to make something more smooth and efficient. We have the word eliminate. To eliminate is to get rid of. If you eliminate something from a process, you remove it from the process. Simplify is to make something more simple, less complicated, easier to understand, easier to do. We also have the word cut down, which is to decrease the amount of, so you can cut down on time, cut down on costs, we also have the word reduce. Now, reduce means a similar thing to cut down. It means decrease the amount of or make smaller. We also have maximize. Now, to maximize is to make something as big as possible, as large as possible to make the most of it. We also have optimize, which is to make as great or as powerful as possible. We have modernize. If you modernize a process, this means you make it more modern, more up to date, maybe more uh, technologically advanced as well. And finally, we have revolutionize. Now, revolutionize is a big claim. It means to change something completely uh, and for the better. Uh, standardize is uh, to make something all uh, conform to one particular standard so that you can measure or compare things directly. 
Uh, so those are some words you can use to convince someone of the benefits of your solution, how you are precisely going to improve it. Because to say you're going to make something better is quite vague. If you want to be more specific, you can give uh, some of those words. Now we have some persuasive language. As I already mentioned earlier, we have uh, using the word you. This is important to show you're speaking directly to your listeners and also to make them feel like they are involved, like they could benefit from what you are saying. We also have, I am confident. If you say, I am confident, this means you are sure about something. And if you say you're confident, hopefully your uh, listener will become confident in what you are saying too. To say, I am certain, again, means that you are sure about something. You know that something is the case. And finally, I assure you. So I assure you is you telling someone that uh, something is going to be the case, something is going to be okay, everything is, uh, is going to go well, everything's going to go as, it, as was planned. Um, no worries at all, Jean-Jacques. I hope I am speaking slowly enough. As um, Axel said, I hope you will uh, be able to learn a few things and it's no problem if you can't understand everything. Uh, you will be able to watch it again. And also, uh, of course, with the words written up, um, you can uh, write them down and try to uh, remember them. But of course, it takes time. Uh, the more you listen to English, uh, the more confident you will feel in understanding it. So uh, don't be discouraged now. Just keep listening and I hope you will, uh, at least you're understanding a third. That's uh, really, really great already um, because this is some higher level English. So uh, yes, you're already doing a great job to understand uh, a third and hopefully you will uh, start to understand more and more. So now we are going to look at some descriptors. Uh, here are some powerful descriptors you can use, but of course these words don't just work by themselves. You need to have facts to back up your claims. Uh, to back up is to support your claims, some evidence, uh, but here are some descriptors you can use. So first we have ultimate. If you describe something as the ultimate solution, this means it's the absolute best, the most extreme, uh, as, as great as you could possibly get it, the only one you need. Now we have first, uh, if you say we are the first, uh, first free language school, for instance, then you'll say first coming before others, you are ahead of everyone else. Uh, to say something is leading, again, this means coming before everything else. It is the best, the most advanced. We have scalable. Now, if something is scalable, it can be upgraded or expanded very easily. This is interesting for uh, maybe investors who want to know if your business would be able to grow. Uh, we have no brainer. This is an idiomatic phrase, which means an obvious choice, something which the, the choice you would make is obvious. So you could say, uh, signing up for language lessons with CPF is a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you? And finally, we have groundbreaking. So if something is groundbreaking, it means it's very, very advanced. It's paving the way uh, for, for advancement for the future. 
Yes, so Corinne, when I say powerful descriptions, it's to uh, describe the solution. So if you want to uh, express to someone why your solution is so great, maybe your product, why your service is so great, then you can use these adjectives or these expressions to describe it. So you might like to say, we have the ultimate solution for um, online communication, for instance. I hope, uh, I'm glad you all learned something new with no brainer, it's a good one to use. I quite like it. So groundbreaking is something very, very advanced something that's very new and that is pushing the boundaries of what has been done before. So that's what groundbreaking is. Does that make sense now? It's something very new and exciting and uh, that you might not have thought was possible before, but now uh, of course it's become possible. So now we will look at, exactly, so groundbreaking is like very innovative, very, very advanced. Thank you, Lorianne. Uh, so now to have another look at what we have learnt, what is the word that means to make something more smooth and efficient? Does anyone know? Brilliant, thank you. Excellent, so it is Streamline. And now, can any of you form a sentence with the phrase, I am confident? There is no right answer. There's no right answer, it's just up to you to form a sentence which uses this phrase, I am confident. Everyone can have a go. As I said, there is no right answer. <laughs> so Corinne, that is a good idea. It almost works. The only thing we need to change is the preposition. So the phrase is to say, you are confident in something. So you would say, I am confident in your marketing plan. I have confidence in your marketing plan. <laughs> I'm very glad you feel confident that this webinar will be useful for, for you. <laughs> I'm confident I will be the best, exactly. Got to have faith in yourself. I'm confident in our line of products, brilliant. I'm confident that this solution is the best. I'm confident Jean-Jacques will improve his English after tonight's course. I very much hope so. I am confident in that too. I'm confident in organizing my holiday on my own. Brilliant, and you can follow it with uh, that, like uh, Basolia did, for instance, or um, I am confident that uh, everyone will hopefully learn something today. So the example I gave, I am confident that using our e-learning platform will increase the speed of your uh, progress in English. So now we will move on to part three, which is answering technical questions. So your audience might have questions based on what you have said. Often these might be quite specific and perhaps technical since they need to find out the finer details. Finer, I'll write it down in the chat. It means more specific the very precise details, the finer details, before they make any decision. So first of all, they might ask about numbers. Maybe they'll want to know uh, how much the product costs. So we'll have a look at some numbers. First, we have 10. Uh, of course, this is just one zero after the one. We have 100, uh, which is two, number and figure. So the difference between those, thank you for your question. Uh, number is more general. You would say, obviously, you learn numbers when you're young. 
Uh, you can think about like ordinal numbers, which are uh, like uh, ordinal, and then you have the cardinal, the cardinal numbers. Uh, and in terms of figure, figure is used much more in a potentially scientific business context when you're speaking about a number that refers to information. So numbers that correspond to information much more likely, but you can use them fairly interchangeably. So we got to 100. Now we will go to 1000. This is in factors of 10. So each time we are timesing by 10. Uh, yeah, so you could say figures in a survey. Uh, sometimes figure can have a different meaning in uh, a paper. A figure could be a diagram or a picture or a table, a way of expressing data. But in this case, I mean figure like just a number. So we have uh, 10,000, then we have 100,000 which is where we've got five zeros. And finally, one million with six zeros. And a small thing to point out, in French, we have this comma, which is a decimal point. Whereas in English, uh, we use the comma to separate the zeros. So one comma zero, zero, zero is not 1.1. .1 that's 1,000. And then we would have a point that looks like a full stop to say 1.1 or 1.2. Okay, now we will have a look at, uh, no, Ariane, so you don't need to have the comma. If you want, you can leave it out. It's just sometimes easier. If you have lots and lots and lots of zeros to split them up into threes so that when you look immediately, you can see much more quickly without having to count every single individual zero. That's why you would use it. It's a space, I believe, in French. You would just leave a space in between the zeros. Great. So uh, some important figures. You can talk about costs. Now, costs uh, is any money that you need to spend, perhaps if you're making a product, any, uh, any money you have to spend on buying materials uh, or paying the people who are making the product, these are costs. Now we have revenue. Revenue is the total income, so the total amount of money you are getting back before uh, any deduction. So it's the, the gross, uh, not sorry, the, yes, the gross uh, amount of money you uh, are receiving. Then profit, profit is any income, any money received that is left after uh, costs or expenses or anything else has been deducted. Now deduct is to take something off. I'll write it in the chat. So once any additional costs or considerations have been taken off, then you uh, then you can call that your profit. So next we have sales. Sales are how many items or units of a service you or, or a product you have sold. So you have given in return for money. And finally, we have a break even point. So as I mentioned earlier, we have costs sometimes uh, in production. And when you break even, uh, this is where the cost of making something equals the amount of money you are getting back from it. So Son, thank you for your question. Uh, no, deduct and deduce do not mean the same thing. So if you deduct something, you take it away. So you might like to um, deduct uh, the cost of uh, your orange juice from your bill. That means you're gonna take it off the bill. And to deduce something means to work it out. So if you deduce something from, uh, something from some information, this means you find out uh, the answer. So you might say, I deduced 
that uh, she had already left because her coat wasn't in the office anymore, if that makes sense. Brilliant, no problem. So some more important uh, phrases referring to figures. So does anyone know what a ballpark figure is? Has anyone heard this phrase before, a ballpark figure? So a ballpark figure is a rough or approximate figure. It's uh, just around about a number. It's not an exact number, a ballpark figure. Next, an estimate. Um, an estimate is a guess, so it's not exact, not exactly what uh, you know it's going to be because you, you don't know yet, but you can estimate based on um, maybe information you already have uh, what, uh, what a number is going to be. Uh, now to forecast is to predict or calculate something about the future. So you might heard of you might have heard of, sorry, of a weather forecast. Uh, a weather forecast tells you what the weather's going to be like in the future, but you can use the term forecast more generally to refer to how things are going to be in the future. Maybe an investor might ask you about your forecasted sales, how much you think you're going to sell in the next year. So uh, estimate and ballpark figures, uh, they don't necessarily mean exactly the same thing because you could have a certain ballpark figure that's based on information you already have, but um, you, just don't, you just aren't going to say the exact number, whereas an estimate is actually a guess, so it's not based on a certain fact. But you can use information, obviously to get it. And now finally, return on investment. If you invest in something, it means you're putting money, you're putting time, you're putting effort into it, and your return on investment is what you get back. So now we're going to have a look at what we've learned. Can you write out this number in words? Try and write it out in the chat in words. Brilliant. Yes, so you're quite right. Uh, Ariane, you just need to make sure you put that and in. So it's 10,010. Excellent. And now, what is a word that means to calculate or predict something about the future? Amazing. Thank you so much. Some you've got it. Everyone's Christelle. Not quite. So deduce is to work something out based on information. It has a very similar meaning now that I am thinking about it. Uh, but in this case, it's not specifically about the future. Uh, the, the precise term we're looking for is forecast because it's very much looking towards the future. And predict, Corinne, yes, predict is also to um, think about something before it has happened. But forecast is the answer I was looking for, but it does work. And finally, what is the word used to say that a figure is rough or approximate? Great, very nice. So yes, it is ballpark, a ballpark figure, but an estimate means something not too far away. <laughs> Excellent, well, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I hope you feel like you learned something. You can type any last questions in the, in the chat. 
Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm glad you enjoyed. Um, si ce webinar vous a plu et que vous souhaitez approfondir votre pratique de l'anglais, euh, n'hésitez pas à faire une demande d'information sur notre site internet. Euh, nous serons heureux de vous présenter nos formations en détail et même de vous proposer un test de niveau gratuit à l'oral avec un de nos professeurs. So, yes, if you would like to continue learning, please come and see us and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, find the course that suits you. <laughs> so, thank you so much for coming. Jean-Jacques, there are courses of all levels, whichever suits you, so you would be able to take uh, the lessons for your level, for your B1. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a lovely week. Bye-bye.